Welcome to Discovery Lab. We have candidates talking today who are competing for positions in the House of Commons, and it's a great privilege to have Melanie Hoffman from the Green Party today representing Edmonton Riverbend. We also have Brittany Wiseman. She'll be chairing today's session and taking the questions. And without further ado, because this is our second session today, I'll let Brittany kick off our session from the Green Party. Yeah, hello everyone. So uh, my name is Brittany. I'm currently a research assistant in Michael's lab at the U of A. Um, and this is Melanie Hoffman. She is the Green Party candidate for Edmonton Riverbend. If anyone has any questions throughout her talk, feel free to put them in the chat and I will regulate that when she's done her discussion. All right, Melanie, you can go ahead. Thank you so much, Brittany. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, have a conversation here today and uh, to share a bit of my story and how I have come to um, wander from a PhD in chemistry and a background in education into seeking to represent uh, Edmonton Riverbend in our parliament. And so, um, yeah, my, my name is Melanie uh, Hoffman. I grew up in Germany and um, I'm now a proud Canadian. Uh, my husband is, uh, is an Edmontonian and this is uh, very much where we are rooted and building community. And so I want to share a little bit about what I'm thinking about and then um, what the solutions are <clears throat> that have led me to seek candidacy with the Green Party of Canada. And so um, to start this off in a good way, um, when we get to the root of the issues that we're dealing with today, it's really about broken relationships. And a first step in healing those relationships um, is learning about um, the relationship to the land and the relationship of people to the land. I've been uh, rediscovering this for myself and learning a lot in this context. And it is with uh, great gratitude that I honor and thank all those that have gone before me to enable the life that we enjoy here. Uh, be that my family, uh, my family of friends that uplifts me and supports me um, and nature and the environment that enable us to do the work that we choose to do um, or are able to do. And here, uh, living in Edmonton, uh, which is known to the Cree as Amasquatchee, Weskahigan, um, I seek to learn about and to um, build relationships with the people uh, who have tended to this land for times immemorial. And so as a member of Treaty 6, I want to um, honor the presence here of the Cree, the Dene, the Blackfoot, the Nakota Sioux, the Iroquois, the Soto and even the Inuit, Edmonton is home to uh, some, some of the most diverse indigenous populations in Canada. And um, yeah, this is something that I personally and um, the Green Party of Canada seek to uh, prioritize and uh, do active work in. And so thinking about uh, sustainable economic growth. Um, for me, what's behind that is thinking about thriving together. And uh, really fundamental to that is to consider how it is that we understand the world. We all come to these questions from a different area of expertise, from a different area of experiences and interests and passions and abilities. And so I just want to share uh, with you where I'm coming from um, as I approach this question. And so having um, recognized that my conversations with representatives are not getting me um, where I want to go, I have stepped into seeking to be that representative myself and recognize my alignment with global green values. So I am running to represent my constituents with a commitment to participatory democracy, respect for diversity, nonviolence, ecological wisdom, social justice, and of course, sustainability. And uh, I think this picture here helps me personally um, to recognize the fragility of this vast system that we call home. It's a photograph of planet Earth from space. It's known as the blue marble. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's just marvelous to me as a scientist that we have this kind of insight um, into being able to look down from the outside. And so I understand that, you know, most of the energy that we receive comes from outer space. Um, and it's mostly coming to us from the sun. Um, we have very specific conditions in our atmosphere that lead to a habitable climate on this planet in our solar system. 
Um, this planet, our blue planet, this climate enables the environment um, that we know and love. Um, personally, I've always been really passionate about visiting other places and seeing uh, the amazing things that nature offers. And then the amazing things that humanity has developed within that environment as our societies have been able to flourish over this period of stability that we've been enjoying through the Holocene. Um, and in which then, of course, our economy um, has developed and exists. And so um, for me, it's really important to recognize that um, I've spent my lifetime uh, really being curious about the laws of nature. And the laws of nature are not laws that humans write. Um, those are laws that we study to understand and describe. We can uh, modify the inputs. We cannot modify those laws themselves. The laws of our society and our economy are man-made. This is where our control lies. And so I just want to emphasize that in those contexts, I look to the experts in their fields. My expertise is somewhere here in this Venn diagram, a very, very small piece of materials and how we are able to make them and how they uh, serve our economy and our society, how they come from the environment and how they impact the environment. Um, and our climate. And so of course we have all of these interactions and we have lots of individuals who are knowledge keepers in our society who spend a lot of time becoming experts. And I value that expertise and have a commitment to listen with humility to experts in their field. Something that we probably all wish our uh, provincial government in particular uh, did with a little more um, commitment to uh, the well-being of our people. And so here we sit today in gorgeous Edmonton, where we are really lucky to be relatively untouched by the changing climate that is already causing instability in many places around the world. And uh, even The Guardian has picked up on this idea that here in Edmonton, we've just, or in Alberta, we've just had the best summer ever which we know has had uh, consequences for our society that especially our healthcare workers and our educators are feeling really um, uh, acutely as well as of course the business struggles that come with this. But uh, do you notice anything different here? Um, we also are living in this backdrop of more and more regularly having our country covered in thick wildfire smoke. It feels, smells and looks bad is a serious health concern, as well as, of course, a deterrent for the visitor economy that we in Edmonton are counting very strongly upon. Then you pair that with uh, reports from across Alberta that farmers are forced to sell their livestock under value this summer as the weather was too erratic for them to grow the necessary feed to bring livestock through the winter. Rain and heat now occur at the wrong times. Constituents in my riding in Edmonton Riverbend will um, remember well that we had water use restrictions this summer as we were putting too much draw on our water source, the North Saskatchewan River. And all that while our glaciers, the source of our drinking water for the summer months are melting at unprecedented rates. And so it is under this backdrop that we consider how do we build resilience and um, strength in our society and in our economy to move forward. And uh, so just to give us a really quick overview of uh, what we really need to know about climate science, I really appreciate the framing from climate scientists uh, Kim Nicholas and Seth Wines, who's now um, at the University of Victoria. Um, where, who, who share with us that really what we need to know is, um, yes, it's warming. Um, yes, it's us, it's human caused. Um, we're sure experts agree on this issue. It's bad. Um, I, I moved into teaching community climate solutions from a chemistry background and I was interested in this and had no idea how well we understand how serious this situation is. But number two is actually also part of the good news, because if this is not some external factor that we don't control, that means we might actually control this. And that's the good news is number five. Um, we have everything we need to, to, to move into a flourishing society um, that is uh, doing what they need to secure our future. And so, You'll recognize um, that uh, the, the big contributor to climate change is carbon dioxide. 
These are Canada's greenhouse gas emissions for the year of 2019. So 80% of our contributions into the atmosphere of greenhouse gases was carbon dioxide. And then if we look at the sources of those greenhouse gases, uh, many of these other greenhouse gases are from these front sectors here. And then the majority, again, comes from the burning of fossil fuels. Our economic growth in the global north ceased being sustainable about 100 years ago. We've known that for a long time, for about that length of time. Um, and so it is in that recognition that um, a decoupling of uh, resource use and of emissions from economic growth as uh, we have practiced it has not happened that I am a, a staunch advocate for an economy that serves the people. And so really what I wanted to do was I wanted to title this talk Sustainable Economic Growth or What is an Oxymoron? Because growing our economy as it stands right now is dooming the future of humanity. So what do we really mean when we're thinking about a sustainable economy? That's kind of the summary of the bad news. So let's move into the good news because we do have a huge Swiss army knife of solutions available right now to tackle this. And it will take all of these different functions of the Swiss army knife together to make it happen. Really key is for us to recognize the difference between our wants and needs. Science and nature are telling us that we do not actually have to consume at a breakneck pace every day of our lives. This is clearly not the path that creates a future. And personally, COVID-19 with all of its difficulties has been a big opportunity to remind me what matters and what I value and what I really need. And so to make the solutions really simple, really it's the three R's that we've been talking about for far too long. And I've added a few more R's here, but we need to like do it for real, not for like pretending that we're recycling. Um, so how do we reduce or refuse what we don't need? How do we reuse or repair those things that we are losing that serve us well? What do we need to recycle or rot so that it can contribute in a new form um, in a circular economy? And so it's not quite Halloween yet, but I'm gonna say something really scary right now. Degrowth. So take a moment here. What does that mean to you? Can you be curious about the automatic response that you might be experiencing right now in response to this word? Is it positive? Is it negative? Can you establish why it's positive or negative? And so personally, I know that I have certainly grown up in a society that has taught me that growth is good. And I would say that like the growth of my compassion, my understanding, my awareness, all of these are great things. Watching my daughter grow is an absolute blessing. Um, she has uh, really, uh, we've, we have a lot of gratitude for our healthcare system. And so being able to watch her grow is an honor. Uh, on the other hand, you've got my dog here, who's then playing at Terwilliger in the summertime, uh, in the springtime. Um, there, we had the experience this summer of uh, how growth is not always a good thing. So you, I'm sure, can think of your own um, examples where growth is not something that is positive at all. And so what do we want to grow and what do we want to let go in order to move forward into a good future? And so that's how I think about degrowth. Um, I've been fascinated to learn that uh, the um, Genuine Progress Indicator um, also originates out of work here in Edmonton. Um, and so I will be looking at, um, in that context, joining the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, an alliance that is currently um, got a presence of uh, Scotland, Iceland, Wales, and New Zealand that are committed to developing a well-being economy, moving away from that focus on GDP to a focus of what serves the people, what serves the environment, what serves our society. 
And um, I am very committed to the implementation of the framework of Project Drawdown to the point of having co-founded a movement in Alberta around Drawdown Alberta. And this is the most comprehensive plan to use currently available solutions, currently available technology to get to a sustainable society. Their framework tells us this can be done globally by 2040. And so this is why I have stepped into being daring as your green candidate. We have the chance of a lifetime to simultaneously tackle the climate crisis while building a prosperous and sustainable local economy. Uh, in response to building back better from COVID-19, which has been so devastating for our communities and our economy. This is the time for completing our social safety net. Nobody in Canada should fall through the cracks when we can make a difference. We're committed to life with dignity for all. And I'm committed to true action towards reconciliation, dismantling systemic racism and uplifting diversity um, in all of our fields. And so, I'm proud to offer Edmonton Riverbend the choice of voting for a true climate champion and a true community champion in this upcoming election and uh, invite you on September 20th to vote for Melanie Hoffman. I'm very happy to answer your questions. All right, awesome. Thank you so much, Melanie, for your chat. Um, I invite Michael, uh, if you'd like to ask your question to Melanie directly, uh, you can go ahead. Great, thank you, Melanie. That was a great talk, and it challenged us in important ways. I think um, we have a lot of great startups here in Alberta that are trying to come up with solutions, including to the issues around climate change, but they often have a hard time staying around here. It's hard to find the, the funding uh, that they need to grow as a company to hire people and um, come up with new technologies that are actually workable and scalable. What would you and the Green Party do to help such companies form and grow up in Canada and Alberta and Edmonton? Uh, when they're trying to tackle these important problems and uh, really uh, grow here rather than leave for the US or wherever else there's more funding available uh, to grow companies that are really innovative. Such a great and important question. Absolutely, Michael. And so um, in uh, the um, envisioning of that green recovery and that development of a green, like a truly green economy, a big part of that is also around localization. Um, and so making sure that the funding is available um, to startups, not just to get their idea off the ground, but then also to have some sustainability through um, the, the later stages and to look at how a true local integration um, serves the community and serves their business. Um, so looking really more at um, ultimately less at scaling within that business, um, but share, developing those um, ideas in <clears throat> the local communities across the province. And so, um, yeah, what I would say there is um, increasing that bridge funding and ensuring that um, the conditions are right for folks to be able to share those innovations um, in their community. In terms of keeping those uh, companies local, I think what's really important to um, emphasize is um, giving an advantage to the local business over you know, doing your business from elsewhere. And so a big piece there is um, looking at things like a, a, garbage, a sorry, <laughs> border carbon tax adjustment um, that makes it very clear that we're committed to holding everyone to the standards that we have here and that we are um, primarily supporting our local business owners over external. All right, thank you. Um, I have another question that I will uh, ask you myself um, from the chat. Um, so I understand that the Green Party is obviously big on, on sustainability and economic growth, which is important, um, but there's other issues currently uh, in Canada, such as the drinking and water advisories that are in effect for First Nations communities across the country. Um, what actions would you and the Green Party take to ensure that all Canadians have access to clean drinking water, regardless of their geographic location? That's an awesome question. Thanks, Brittany. Um, absolutely. Um, you know, I think 
I can, this is a question that's so um, deeply intertwined with our work with um, First Nations, uh, Métis and Inuit across um, Turtle Island, across uh, Canada and, uh, and ultimately the US. Uh, our national borders are not so meaningful um, in their context. And so um, that actually begins for me with a review of um, the, the Indian Act um, in particular, um, but then addressing access to foundational human needs, um, safe access to drinking water and access to food um, also ties into our um, resource use and development, right? And so, um, yes, that would be a uh, high priority to ensure that um, we address this issue um, from multiple angles. One is providing the available technology at this point in time to um, be able to produce clean drinking water in place. Um, but then of course the bigger um, question is why is there no clean drinking water available? Um, what's the, what are the sources of pollution and what do we need to change in order to um, establish um, the, the natural environment um, to regenerate the natural environment there. Um, so that would be an important focus um, in actually also a context of economic and societal development, right? Because for a developed nation, it is very embarrassing um, that we have uh, these, these issues and that we're not making the change that is needed. Thank you, Melanie. Um, the next question is by Tanvir. Um, I invite you to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question to Melanie. Hey, Melanie, thank you for giving us insight on the policies. Uh, I have a very simple questions. What are those three practical steps as a policymakers, uh, or I'm talking about the provincial government that we have taken to diversify our economic needs for future here in Alberta? Um, sorry, can I just clarify, are you asking what steps the province has taken or like practi practical projects or if, if, can you set up like some examples like you know these are the three major projects that we have launched, like you know, towards diversifying our economy in future from oil and gas to you know, like more diversifying. Um... Okay, so I'm not quite sure uh, if you're asking me to comment on what the province has done. Um, I um, you can take it like what? Where are you gonna take as a okay. green party? Yeah, that's yeah. what that's what I was uh, sorry trying to get to because um, yeah, uh, that's certainly of course what I'm I'm interested in talking about. And so um, you know, I guess in terms of what I have done, um, you know, because of the frustration of um, not. Um, seeing in the in the public discourse in the governmental discourse um, the directions that I believe uh, we could be taking um, is uh, is actually why I went ahead and called together um, people to um, begin working together in this movement around drawdown Alberta um, because uh, if you go to drawdown.org their uh, framework very much sort of shows up um, what are the jobs of the future? What are the um, projects that we want to be working on and that we can be working on right now that actually um, are, are already available? Um, and so strengthening these um, directions through um, redirecting subsidies into um, the businesses that are seeking to um, establish these solutions in our communities, be it uh, rural or urban, um, would be uh, a really important focus and um, looking at the necessary transition, learning from COVID um, and the need for um, ensuring everyone um, having their basic needs met, looking at uh, guaranteed livable income um, and how what the role of that is in ensuring that everyone has a roof over their head and food on the table. And um, yeah, then looking at the um, community 
benefits that come from implementing uh, these these solutions that address the climate crisis, but when implemented in a good way, also address some of the key concerns that we're dealing with in terms of affordability of housing, in terms of food security, in terms of inequality um, in our country. And so working hand in hand with um, indigenous leadership, as well as uh, with representatives from um, communities that are struggling um, to ensure that um, the, the process is done in a good way. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Melanie. Um, all right, it looks like Michael has another question for you. Uh, Michael, you can go ahead and ask Melanie your question. Hi, Melanie. Another question here about climate change. It's a really big issue, and it's not just technology that we need, of course. We need to get people to understand and change behavior sometimes, and that's not easy. Um, we really need to have um, encompassing solutions to obtain a net negative emissions situation, but enforcing that is really, really tough. We've got to get people on board. What specific goals do you have in regards to climate change and how are you going to deliver these? How are you going to encompass all of these different um, technologies, ideas and people, uh, as well as the need to have some economic stability, at least? Um, yeah. It's a tough problem. What, what's your solution? Definitely a tough problem. Um, absolutely. Thanks, Michael. And so, um, yeah, I was actually I was proud to see yesterday the Climate Action Network came out with their um, analysis of platforms and um, they very clearly show why it is that I have chosen to be a representative of uh, the Green Party, um, because we have um, the targets that are appropriate in terms of a 60% reduction of greenhouse gases. Um, by 2030, which is incredibly ambitious. And so how do we do that? How do we go about that? Um, the exciting thing for me around looking at the solutions is actually that a lot of this um, serves our communities and creates jobs. Um, and in the long run will um, pay us back in terms of uh, the, the monetary investment that is present. Um, and so one piece that uh, I'm personally involved in is this kind of a panelized retrofit. Um, we have 80% of the housing that is going to be, uh, or the buildings that are going to be on this planet in 2050 are already there right now. And so we know that we need to retrofit these buildings to reduce our energy um, waste because 40% of our emissions right now come from buildings. Um, and so uh, next to my frustration with the fact that we still don't have a building code that requires builders to build even net zero ready, we have this difficulty of needing to retrofit the existing building stock. Um, and so uh, there's this initiative, um, these pictures here are from the Sundance project in Edmonton um, to do panelized retrofits. Um, and so you need, uh, you need measurement expertise, you need skills uh, in the construction industry, um, and um, you need a whole lot of people to make this work happen to retrofit all of that building stock in the next three decades. Um, and so we are going to see growth in the construction industry around um, being able to reduce our energy waste here. Um, we are seeing growth um, in responsible resource use and uh, social enterprise that is looking at ways to reduce our food waste. Um, COVID really showed us how sensitive to disruption our global supply chains are. So looking at, you know, what can we localize? What could be grown right here? Um, eating more seasonally and um, just generally have healing our relationship with food, I guess is one way that I certainly think about that. Um, I grow food in my front yard, so, so it's a personal hobby. Um, and then a huge opportunity for growth in regenerative agriculture. Um, so where we know that we need to reduce fossil fuel use, we need to reduce our use of livestock, um, we need to reduce our use of fertilizers. And here's just one image of a regenerative farm here in Alberta, the Cohen farm. Um, where you're working with ecological systems to produce smaller numbers of livestock and um, you know veg vegetables and, and such things um, in a way that actually also serves um, reducing the the sixth mass extinction. So it's absolutely not you know this horrifying life of uh, deprivation that we are proposing moving into. It's actually a life that is richer in relationships, um, richer in meaningful work. 
um, and uh, and richer in just the diversity of what we have. And so, of course, our top um, solutions are going to include our growth in renewables. Um, actually, uh, yeah, if I'm, I'm just going to come back to that for a second. Michael, what do you think? How much space do we need in Alberta to uh, um, serve all of our energy needs just with solar? That's a good question. I suspect that we have it. Um, I think people are skeptical, though. Maybe the temperature they're worried about or the snow. Um, is it just the, yeah, the snow is fair? I have solar on my roof and, and we've been advised not to remove the snow uh, in the winter time. Um, obviously, if you're doing a larger scale project, that's something that you'd be looking at. But yeah, I was really surprised myself to learn that this little blue square down here is all of the area in Alberta that we would have to cover with solar panels to generate our entire energy from solar. And of course, that's not what we're going to do anyway, because we want a diversified stream of energy. Um, and um, solar does work better in cold temperatures. So we have great potential here. Um, but of course, yeah, we, we need a, a diversified system. Um, but then we have one that does not need any fuel inputs. Yeah, so these are some of the pieces of uh, what would be part of those solutions. Awesome. Thanks so much, Melanie. Those are really great slides. Um, we're getting close to the end here. So I'll let Gary, uh, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask the last question, uh, and then we'll wrap up afterwards. Go ahead, Gary. All right, thanks. Um, yeah, I've been noticing the environmental problem for a long time. But anyway, I'm going to make it really short. I have tons of other questions. But so, uh, so from now to the green goal that I know, but right now we need to experience in the next 50 years, maybe 60 years of extreme weather. Well, climate, I wonder, uh, uh, because we've seen what's happening in Belgium, Germany, uh, mainland China, uh, US about the flooding, the drought that we had, the forest fire, even Slave Lake got the half, you know, three, uh, one third of their town got burned. Does, you know, does overall the whole Alberta as, as a whole, like, you know, for all the major cities and towns, are they, you know, do they have any kind of policy plan to help us to, you know, face the loss due to extreme weather, insurance policy or anything that can actually help us because it could be very close to the near future for these kind of damages. Gary, thank you for this excellent, excellent question. Yes, um, I have uh, friends that are involved in the relief efforts in, in Germany right now. And um, these are experiences that many other countries have been having for a longer time already. So yes, this is absolutely something we are going to be dealing with, um, whether we go this economic route or a different route as just a question of how much worse it's we're, we're going to let it get. And so yes, right, we are facing a need to adapt and a need to build resilience um, in this context. Um, some Albertans will have noticed already that insurance premiums are going up because insurers know climate change is real and they know that they can't afford to pay for the damages that are going to happen. So how do we build community resilience um, in the face of um, these facts? Um, the, a number of cities across the province are um, very strongly engaged um, in their planning around community resilience and understanding um, what is needed. And so that also goes into things um, like the question of how do we retrofit buildings? How do we build a resilient um, local energy grid and local food supplies so that um, we have resilience against disruption um, that will happen? Um, and so looking to, um, again, I guess I'm, I'm thinking of ecological wisdom in that context of, you know, looking to um, traditional ways of um, building fire resilience um, and uplifting uh, what nature itself does well um, is certainly one direction that um, I would place added value onto next to the technological um, adaptations that um, places like the city of Edmonton are, are strongly engaged in. And so the federal government has a big role to play there in terms of providing funding, um, which they are doing and um, will need to strengthen in order to um, build our capacity to live those good lives that we strive for um, and to also welcome um, those whose lives are being uh, disrupted and destroyed by um, climate conditions in other places in the world. Awesome. Thanks so much, Melanie, uh, for answering all the questions and for your time today.
Um, I'll just pass it on to Michael to let him close the discussion. Uh, go ahead, Michael. Thanks very much. Um, sorry, thanks very much, Melanie, for sharing your, your talk today. It was, um, you covered a lot of ground. We learned a lot and it's impressive what you're trying to accomplish. Um, thank you, Brittany, for chairing today's meeting. It was great to have so many questions today from our audience. Uh, we're looking forward to sharing this video shortly. Uh, I wish you all a wonderful weekend. Uh, you're all welcome to our next event on Tuesday, where we have the Edmonton Mayoral Forum, where we will also be talking about economic growth and how to balance the complexity of the equations that we face. So it's really great to get the perspective on the federal level today. It'll help give us a really good foundation as we move forward together. So thank you all. I really appreciate your time, and I'll see you next time.